Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Coronet's drive through right here on another beautiful day. I think it's about to be spring, and of <laughs> course, daylight savings has hit. We have a little bit of extra daylight, but we lost an hour, and maybe we're going to lose more than that here today. I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and here with me, the star of the drive through Mr. Happiness himself, Jim Cornette. Well, uh, Brian, why don't you come out and, and just say, yes, the, the sun is shining and the birds are singing and the, and the wildlife is frolicking in the, in the bushes because you're on some kind of f***ing drugs. And, and your, your, your reality is, is, is somehow altered. And, you, and the way you perceive things, you're in a more elated and instead of deflated state of mind like you usually are. I wish that were true, but unfortunately, when you and Stephen P. New got together a couple of years ago to institute that new wellness policy for the Cult of Cornet and for these programs, I haven't been able to do any drugs on the air, so that's not true. Well, I've, you've, now you've, 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 you've just blown my mind. <laughs> that you've, been, you've, you've been malingering for medical issues over the last day or two, which is why we're a bit late, but now you, you're, you're not on any type of mind-altering substances? Well, I mean, mind-altering, no. I'm on Percocet and caffeine. Well, uh, you, well uh, there you go. You got the Percocet on your back. But the I got Percocet a prescription. Monkey. I got a prescription, so I'm good with the wellness program. Well, you're not violating the wellness program, but you're not in a proper state of mind. And, and ju to think that that while i have been now l let me tell the people what happened to you here's what happened to brian last poor fella a couple days ago he got up in the middle of the night go to the bathroom get a drink of water and the seat fell on his head and gave him a concussion oh get the fuck out of here come and on and they had to take you in and give you a brain scan but fortunately they found nothing Brian, did they actually, from what I've heard, they actually had to take your brain out and then put it back in again? Is this what you heard in The Observer? Is, that's what I heard in The Observer when they broke in with the breaking news about it. No, that's not true. Just for the record, so we can start to show off and let people know what's going on. A couple of days ago, I had scheduled surgery on my shoulder, my shoulder blade, my back. There were complications, so then I had a second surgery, and now I'm home, and I'm drugged up, <laughs> and I'm ready to try to do whatever the hell it is that we do here on this show. But that's the and this, this is your show. This is your show. Yes. And I have to follow a person who's hopped up on whatever kind of goddamn Bolivian street drugs they gave you up at that hospital in New Jersey. They don't have fine hospitals up there like they do down here in Kentucky. They wouldn't have to do it twice if the guy knew what he was doing. That's why they call it practicing medicine. That's what they were doing on you, practicing. I believe the hospital I was in is the number one hospital in the state, <laughs> but I think well, everything went like all right. Well, that's like being the nicest guy in prison. You're still in the state of New Jersey. Come on. Hey, it went better than last time. You know, I had this done in 2007, and that, I never told you about this, that ended up being a complete mental nightmare, because I had this done, I had a good doctor, she recommended a good surgeon, he seemed all right, you know, Jewish guy, and I'm Jewish, that always puts you at ease. I should have known something was up, because he had like glassy eyes, or just kind of... <laughs> there was something in his eyes that he was like wild eyed. I should have known something was up. <laughs> Wait a minute. You've got this fucking Marty Feldman fucking look alike at a goddamn <laughs> operate on you. I didn't say Marty Feldman. See, now it gets funnier <laughs> now that you put that vision in my head. But there was something. I should have known something was off. So they do the surgery. I'm there. I'm talking to the anesthesia guy. Very nice guys, cracking jokes. They do the surgery. Seems like everything goes okay. A few months later, I get a letter from the New York City Board of Health <laughs> telling me that they've been informed that various patients, and they're not exactly sure how many, who not only went to this doctor, but specifically dealt with this anesthesiologist, have been infected with hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and potentially HIV. And I need to go get tested immediately. They've been using dirty needles. So now I'm like, Oh, fuck. It's over. Like, this is how it ends. This fucking guy. <laughs> the next day, because I read at least two newspapers a day, and back then I was getting the New York Post and the Daily News delivered to my house. It was a full-page story in the New York Post. The smiling, joking, mustached anesthesiologist. They must have caught him walking to his car and just yelled his name, and he turned around. 
they got the most sinister photo of this guy you've ever seen. <laughs> and it turned out he was using dirty fucking needles all over the place, apparently, for what a long period hell? of time. How much how much money can could he have been pocketing by doing something like that? Would that have been the only motivation? You would think, and I, I guess that's kind of the same question I had. What's the benefit of this? Are you really saving that much? Luckily, I was okay. I had nothing. And they paid for all my testing and everything. But I'm Jewish and neurotic, so I was... Oh my God, I'm dying. I'm dying. Well, of this well, man. Wait, 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 I can immediately tell also because you said, well, fortunately, I had nothing. And they paid for all the testing. I would, I was like, goddamn, here, here's a thousand dollars. Put me up on the rack and run me from stem to stern. But yeah, so that was the bad Did experience. Did he leave last anything time. around in me anywhere when they were fucking around in there? Yeah, so that was that. And uh, after everything that went down with my dad last year, I decided now's the time. Every single thing that could well, possibly be wrong with me, I'm going to have everything worked on and looked at. So. You know, that shoulder, if you'd quit patting yourself on the back so much, you wouldn't have to keep having it, having it fixed like that. And I can't lift more than 10 pounds for the foreseeable future, so masturbation's well, out the window. You couldn't lift more than 10 pounds before. Oh, stop it. I can lift that's, more than you. I can lift that's more what than you. The, that's what the butler's for anyway up there. <laughs> he, he buttles and lifts, but Listen. let me... <laughs> Anyway, I'll have you. And also, you said this. Oh, I'm going in and out. It's an outpatient thing. And then you said, Oh, I'm going to be overnight. I'm overnight. I was like, What the fuck? They put my ACL back together and kicked me out an hour and a half. Well, I had, they, I had the first surgery, and I was in, I guess, post op. Suzanne's there. All the nurses are there. Everyone's having a great time. They give me my ginger ale. They give me an ice pop. <laughs> and then they notice, like, Oh shit, there's a giant hard hematoma fo uh, forming foaming foaming not foaming thankfully that would have been really uh bad <laughs> but forming where they did the surgery so like we think we have to go back in we have to find the doctor who went home and get him back so the second surgery was like eleven thirty that night and that was that ah uh, and then they got in there and and they found a fucking a pez a Pez, really? Either that or a Junior Mint. You like Pez? Which one was it? It was the Junior Mint. Junior Mint on Seinfeld, but let's talk about Pez. Mint. Do you like Pez? Watley, yeah, he was always a great guy. The but candy. nevertheless. The candy Pez. No, the Spencer and the candy. I don't frolic around with such things. When you were a kid, you didn't like Pez dispensers? I don't think they had Pez dispensers when I was a kid. Oh, come on. I never saw one. I got, I went over to the general store and dipped my hand in the barrel like all the other kids to get my candy. The barrel? And liked it. What? What was yeah. in the barrel? What are you talking about? Right next to the pickle barrel and the cracker barrel. At the pharmacy? Over at the, over at the general store. Sam Drucker's place. That's where we used to go shopping back in my day. What day was that? Tuesday. <laughs> but let me ask you that. Let's go back to your fucking yes. medically induced coma. Let's continue the happy talk. Because the, the thing that was, was most poetic this week was that while you were actually being placed under the effects of anesthesia for a surgical procedure, Possibly done by someone who's using dirty scalpels or whatever the no, fuck. No, no, no. The next scandal. No, these people were good. I, I like these people. Well, yeah, you yeah, like the other guy, except for his glassy eyes. Well, that wasn't the anesthesiologist. It, that was the goofy doctor, yeah. Well, and then and, and he was using the anesthesiologist. And by the way, I thing. looked him up. I wondered, whatever happened to that fucking doctor, you know? I looked him up. I don't know the specifics, <laughs> and I don't know if it affected me at all. Again, I had to have this redone now, but the first one was in 2007. He's no longer a surgeon. Apparently, he's no longer allowed to be a surgeon. <laughs> he is now doing hair replacement surgery. In <laughs> so that was an interesting thing to learn. Apparently, if you lose the ability to actually do surgeries as a doctor, you can just get a job doing hair replacement. Well, what can possibly go wrong? I don't know. Ask QT Marshall. But nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, so... Back to this previous, the, the, the current quack that was, that was uh, the, the anesthesiologist, the gas passer, as they say in the trade, they're about to put you under so that they can 
roam around inside you and do all kinds of heinous things and who know leave who knows what kind of fucking botulism and domain and pestilence inside you. And at the very same time as that, Brian, in a one of those poetic justice moments, million well, millions of people, hundreds of people with millions of accounts on Twitter are <laughs> wishing you are wishing the the grisliest of deaths upon you and I. <laughs> yeah, the timing was impeccable. But, you know, while you drink their tears, all I could do is mock them. So it kind of made the thing better, because I think it's all funny. Well, you've now you've established a, a uh, an award that you're giving out once a day. Once a day when I could find someone good. I haven't looked through everything today, but the Elite Fan Showcase of the Day. Everyone wants to talk about the cult of Cornette and how mean and awful we are because we disagree with everyone on the crappy wrestling they like. We decided we would focus on the real toxic fan base, the real problems out there, the ninnies, the namby pambies who can't cope with anything. So they send insane letters or tweets, messages. Sometimes they put stuff on message boards, think they can hide. And we're just going to start focusing on these people and showing everyone who they are, and in some cases, maybe exposing who they are, stay tuned. There's going to be more to come with this. Well, and the one that you tweeted the other day, it, and I, I retweeted this with this comment because, again, at my age, not a lot touches me anymore, you know, but it did bring a wistful tear of nostalgia to my eye that this blithering nincompoop his letter, his email, except it was exactly the same as a, a letter that I would have gotten from a 14-year-old female fan of the Rock and Roll Express in 1986, the only difference being those were written in crayon and mailed with a stamp. And this is from what is allegedly trying to pass for a grown adult... <laughs> human fucking being and it's it, it, it like it, and you saw some of them in the midnight express scrapbook some of the better ones where the the girls would draw pictures of donkeys with big dicks that would be sticking in my mouth and and this is you with an arrow to it right and and you know or the here this is i picked this just fresh just for you and they would put a real booger on the letter and circle it and then fucking mail it. And it's the same literally wording in some cases and mindset, but we're we're 40, 40 some years later, 40 years later almost, and instead of teenage girls smitten with the, you know, Sean Cassidy, Leif Garrett, you know, fucking phase of their life, these are apparently f and functioning men, well, I won't say men, m m males that are so broken up and their heads are on fire and they're, oh my God, about their one of their favorite, maybe not even their single favorite, but one of their favorite girl wrestlers. It's, it's, it's I don't know how to explain this phenomenon, would you care to weigh in? I think there are a lot of people, and when you say, we say a lot of people, several hundred, really, when it comes down to it, who, again, they can't cope. They can't deal with the real world. They flip out over everything you say, although they want to say you're irrelevant and they don't listen. They seem to know every single thing you're saying, although a lot of it's out of context. And I think it bothers a lot of people. If we're going to go back a ways, there was a concerted effort from people like the Young Bucks and Colt Cabana, people who had a problem with you, to make sure that any fans who didn't would. People who had a problem with you for either not using them or not just doing whatever they wanted. It began like a little over 10 years ago, the idea that Jim Cornette was this and that. And I think it bothers them and a lot of their fans that it hasn't worked out well. Because if we look at AEW, Every the, single the, week, the the indie. Let's refer to them going forward. The indie mindset crowd. 
Well, the weak mind has been trying mindset, to. Correct. Well, the the uh, the indie mindset wrestling wrestlers. I'm not talking about fans. I'm talking about the indie mindset wrestlers started that effort, their little clique, and wanted to take over the wrestling world. And we'll we'll see how it's going for them. But go yeah. ahead. And here we are now with the largest audience in wrestling audio history that grows every single week. And while promotions like AEW have a tough time holding on to their fans. We do nothing but grow. And I think when it hits some people, they realize, oh shit, we haven't been able to stop them. Not everyone thinks like us, that they're the worst people in the world because they don't like the wrestling we like, or they say funny things about the wrestlers that hey, we've never met, but we care so much about. And that's the reality. We keep growing. Every episode is bigger than the one before it. Every month is bigger than the one before it. And every year is bigger than the month before it. We've had exponential growth. And one day, maybe people will realize just how big this audience is. But I think that's the problem. You And how been humble stopped. you are. One of these days, people will realize how humble you are. Do I say anything that isn't true? I didn't say you were lying. I just said, you know, they'll realize how humble you are. But you know what this whole thing is about the Riho scandal here? And, and I, while you were... In that medically induced coma, I was trending again for three days because of people bantering back and forth about, you know, which different ways that we should be boiled in oil and have our fat sold for soap. But you know what this whole phenomenon is like? You know, I can only think of one thing. Actually, I've got two words for you, Brian. You know what they are? No. Mary Steenburgen. I have no idea where you're going right now, so I'm... Mary no. Steenburgen, of course, the wife of Ted Danson. I didn't know they were together. What happened to him and Kirstie Alley? That was only on, they weren't even together on Cheers, were they? She was his boss on Cheers. And he I wanted to know. get together I, with her. I really, I, I think she's a train wreck anyway. Well, she's dead. She, she just died oh, a few months ago. She, she did? Well, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> I think she's a train wreck. Well, did she's I, dead. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I haven't fucking kept, I've never paid a lot of attention either way. Nevertheless, you know who really needs to get her shit together, Liz Taylor. <laughs> well, hey, now don't don't you talk. This is what I'm going to talk about here in a second. Let's get back to Mary Mary Steenburgen. Yeah, where are you going with that? Yeah, because here's the thing. Mary Steen was in a, a wonderful flick with Malcolm McDowell back in like 1980, 79, I think maybe. Time after time. Gray underrated film. She's is d done. There's been several. And, and by the way, back in those days, in her younger days, she was quite the looker, as they say. And I've seen her in a couple of other things. I was, well, there's that Mary Steenburgen. I'm, I would kind of say I'm a fan of some of her work. I haven't sought out all of it, the entire canon, but I've seen a few things Mary Steenburgen's in. And she made a nice impression on me. I've never met Mary Steenburgen. Don't know anybody that knows Mary Steenburgen. But boy, in a few movies, she was pretty nice. Now, if I was to hear, much like I didn't hear about poor Kirstie Alley, but if I was to hear that Mary Steenburgen got run over by a rainbow bread truck, I would pause in my day and 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 I would reflect on that and I'd say, well, that's that's just that's that's terrible. And then I would go on with my fucking life. Because I've never met Mary Steenburgen. I don't know any of the pretend. Did she step out in front of the truck? I don't know. She might have brought it on herself. But the point is, now I can understand some people being, you know, worshipful of Elvis or the Beatles or Frank Sinatra, you know, generational world shaking, changing talents. I think, you know, remember the hysteria over Michael, but that's when he died. I don't recall people leaving candlelight vigils for Michael Jackson when he got off Twitter. But back to Mary Steenburgen. It's not like that if somebody in a grocery store or just in a public place, which Twitter kind of is, except it's kind of a anonymous public place, if somebody in my presence said, you know what, that that Mary Steenburgen, she's the shits. It's not like I would do what you what what the fuck? Don't you talk about Mary? 
You mother come over here and say that, Riley. I'll snatch you by the goddamn you, you fucking. No, Mary, oh God, Mary, don't you say. What the fuck? None of them it's, do that either. Again, there's a difference between what you say to people face to face and what you would type online when you're using an alias. Why would I get upset about it enough to type it online? It's Mary fucking Steinbarge and. Well, maybe if you were a steamed virgin, you would be a little more <laughs> upset about it like some of the fans now, of AEW are. That's what a cunning linguist you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. But nevertheless, and now, so the point is, people were just losing their minds on Twitter and their heads were on fire and were every kind of ists in the world. And, and the best part about the, the, the one message you shared was that all of us and all of our fans, anybody who thinks the way we do should get aggressive ass cancer. And which actually, I think somebody is now trademarked as the name of a punk band. But it was the aggressive part that put it over the top. Well, yeah, it, it, you know, because ass cancer would be kind of blasé and every day for the name of a punk <laughs> band. But aggressive ass cancer, that's where, you know, you're getting, so you're getting into some fucking high octane ass cancer. But anyway, after all of this, there were a couple of people with some sense, only a few out of all of this I saw, but a few people with some sense, probably because they didn't really follow Riho on Twitter anyway. So they had to investigate a little further. And this is the latest thing I'm hearing. And folks, feel free to fact check this too if you want to, because it's not like we give a shit. As we mentioned, poor Riho, she's a grown adult, 20 something year old woman with a high paying part time job. That is the, the jury is out uh, on whether she's suited for. And she deleted her Twitter account, which sent any, everybody into flames and immediately. The fingers were pointing at us and our ilk for knocking her bad wrestling. But now some people are saying, well, the last tweet that she made before she deactivated her Twitter was just some innocuous thing. Like, well, you know, I'm sorry I didn't get to see you all on Dark or whatever one of their YouTube shows is because my match got cut off of it. Not like, God damn it, my, they cut my fucking... Performance. It was like, no, I'm sorry I didn't get to see it because they I had a match there, but it got cut. And apparently, a bunch of her Rehoites immediately jumped on that, adding either Tony Khan or AEW on TBS or MOUSE or the president of the goddamn Civil Rights Association or what whoever they could say, well, how dare you cut Reho? And now some people are saying, well, she probably cut it because all of a sudden her fucking fans took some innocuous statement and started adding her fucking boss. How dare you? You've no good slimy pad. We know the verbiage they use. There probably was some things about wanking dogs in there. <laughs> so now is, is, is it, did, did somebody tell her? possibly or she just figure out on her own well now fuck now my twitter people are fucking yelling at tony khan he'll take me off tv and put me in the twilight zone let me just shut this shit down we've said it before and it's true and i know a lot of people don't want to acknowledge it but the most toxic fan base are the aew most hardcore and even a lot of the people who are really into the observer not everyone again not everyone we have a major audience for these shows that are AEW fans. We hear from them. I like AEW. I like Jim's review of AEW. But then there are the fans, again, they can't cope with anything. And if you close your eyes and you think about who they are and what they do and what they look like, you probably can nail it right away. They can't cope with any of this shit. And look at what's happening now. They say all these things but about- But they have too much time to dwell on it. Do do. Uh, <laughs> If you have time in your day to get on Twitter and scream for the execution and or the immolation or persecution or any other shun of people because they, they don't like your fucking favorite girl wrestler, don't you need more things to do productively in your life? 
Twitter exists for a lot of people and message boards exist for a lot of people to fill up the empty time that's not being spent with other human beings or there aren't people that really value that person's thoughts. This is what these things exist for. And for everyone that points to the cult of Cornet and says this and that and this and that. And by the way, go look at Jeremy Bagley's Twitter. Go look at all the various charitable exercises that the cult of Cornet have participated in and all the various good things we've done. I guarantee you, there is no one in AEW who has ever received the vitriol in writing like we have from the AEW fans. We're okay with it. We don't give a shit. We ain't deleting anything. <laughs> but the point is, for everyone's like, oh, the cult of Cornette are so bad. No, it's the opposite. It's you people. You people are the problem. You people. And by the way, we are a bigger audience than you. So if you want to fuck around, fuck around. We already know how this will end. We already know who's going to find out. Yeah. And you need to start taking drugs before the show more often. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because, goddamn, right there was a statement and a half for you. And, that, and by, by the way, um, you know, once again, I appreciate everybody's creativity in trying to think of different ways that we can be flogged in the town square. But at the same time, it does kind of reflect badly when they put these things on Twitter and then everybody makes fun of them for being illiterate, incompetent, irrelevant, or any of the other ends. Um, you guys and, just make you know, us stronger because you cause people who don't listen to us to check us out. And then they hear what you've pointed out out of context. They hear the context and then they hear the rest of the show. Then they start laughing. Then they start learning. Then they get hooked. I, I was just, as I'd said last week, we don't, if, if Riho wants to be an archaeologist or a, a brain surgeon or an international yacht broker from Toulon, France, if those are her strong points and she's interested in those fields, go for it. But again, it is part of the silliness and the childishness and the amateurishness of their indie mindset wrestling group that has tried and so far is failing to take over the wrestling world or they're putting out some crummy programming but they're still far from the big boys but it's it's imagine that let me ask you a question brian who cuts a better wrestling promo me or mr t I mean, that's not really a fair question. As a wrestling promo, obviously it's you. Mr. T's not really a wrestler, and his promos were more about the character of Mr. T. Right. So right. You, I'm giving you the win yeah. over Mr. T. Okay, and actually, if it came down to it, who was the better worker in a professional wrestling match setting as far as taking bumps and understanding how to do the remotest of spots or finishes in 1985, Jim Cornette or Mr. T. Well, again, I don't know if this is a fair comparison. You are exactly. a wrestling genius and a prodigy, and you kind of got it right away. Mr. T was learning on the fly and having a difficult time with some of the people he's working with. Yes. Does that mean that they should have cast me to fight Stallone in fucking Rocky III <laughs> or made me Hulk Hogan's tag team partner? At WrestleMania. Certainly. And how ludicrous and stupid would anybody have been to do that? And how silly would it made the whole fucking deal look? Quite silly. So there you go. <laughs> For the people who say, but Riho can do the moves. Or Pockets can do the moves. Our little puppy Pockets with his hands in his pants. Playing the pocket pool. They can do the move. Well, exactly. So it just makes the fucking business look silly when they do it. Just like I would if I'd have been in the main event at WrestleMania or fought Stallone in Rocky Three, even though technically I could do the lines better and or take the bumps better than the motherfucker that was doing it, who were completely untrained in that particular field of endeavor and weren't natural. It wasn't a natural at it either. 
So just a, a thing for thought.